there, there is that uh, divide today in the blockchain ecosystem with a, a, a very, very mainstream ecosystem of people that are just trying to do business and that are just trying to uh, create financial value. And in order to do that, in order to maximize the financial value, you need to uh, tackle the mainstream. You need to uh, speak, you, you need to be able to, to deal with uh, big traditional uh, financial institutions because that's where the money is. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mutual Knowledge. I am Gautil Mote, your host, and today, well, my guest is Pierre No, another Frenchman with a mix of the two cultures. Hi, Pierre. Nice to have you here. Hi, everyone. Hi, Gautier. And thank you for having me. I keep interviewing French people with a very good level of English, and I keep interviewing you guys in English. That's quite funny. Uh, what can you tell us about yourself, Pierre, uh, to introduce yourself to our audience? Well, uh, I've been uh, so, so. First and foremost, I'm a, I'm a researcher and a lecturer at two different uh, French universities regarding blockchain and digital ethics. Mm -hmm. I have been active in the blockchain ecosystem since 2016, actually, and uh, I've uh, I've worked both for the public sector, the private sector, and on open source projects. Uh, a wide variety of them, but pretty much all of them being uh, impact-oriented uh, blockchain use. So uh, anything that uh, relates to decentralized governance and mostly blockchain for sustainability. Mm. <clears throat> I'm curious about that. Um, what's the public sector like in France in order to... Or, or is it the public sector in the US or in France? In France, in France. I, I've... Uh, <laughs> I've succinctly, I've shortly worked for, for the, the public sector in the US, which is where I learned to conceal my French accent. Uh, oh. <laughs> although for the, for the American audience that loves the romantic French accent, I, I have it here under, uh, uh, I have it in the bag and I can pull it out uh, at any moment. Yes, I will be very happy to speak uh, with, uh, with you like that. Ha, ha, ha. Let's have. Uh... <laughs> yeah, but let, 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 let's try to, to, to keep that um, t discussion legible. Uh, so I've, funnily enough, it's from, uh, I, I'm probably the first uh, generation of uh, blockchain people to, to have come into, to have stepped into the ecosystem because of public action. So oh, right. back in 2016, I was interning for a crowdfunding, a crowd lending platform that is funding renewable energy projects. And it's right when the first mention of blockchain appeared in French law. So Emmanuel Macron, who is now a president, back then he was uh, our Minister of, uh, Economy, Ministry right? of Economy and Finance. And uh, he uh, actually had an executive order or something similar to that, that, that would allow crowd lending loans to uh, be registered uh, and uh, uh, traded on the secondary market thanks to the help of the blockchain. And so because this, because of this innovation, uh, because of this Leo innovation, I wrote a white paper with this uh, company um, dedicated to blockchain and uh, crowdfunding of renewable energies. Funnily enough, we were not, so, so we were doing tokenization of loans long before we used the word tokenization for anything. In 2016, we deemed that Ethereum was too risky, too too young, too nascent of an, ex of an ecosystem to use that. So we were using colored coins, which, as you know, came back to fashion in a in a weird in a weird manner with ordinals. Uh, it was kind of a throwback, but but yeah. So so uh, this white paper actually got noticed by the French administration and was taken in the Caisse de dépôt et de consignation, which oh. is uh, France's main public finance institution, who back in 2017 was uh, kind of the uh, at the avant-garde of the um, uh, blockchain for public space, mm. because we already had uh, a, a team dedicated to uh, blockchain and crypto assets, team that was even part of uh, both policymakers and technical experts like developers. So, so we were able to uh, both train the entire public sphere, regulators, legislators, and the likes, and to innovate to create in-house blockchain-based public services, or at least to have proof of concepts, experimentations. Some of them have been industrialized. 
Wonderful. For, for the, those who um, are listening to us and who don't know in France what the Caisse de dépôt is, a consignation is, so it means the, the deposits. Um, well, it's basically the, the public deposit box of uh, any litigious situation, notably, and so this is a financial institution that performs a publicly managed um, escrow, state-managed escrow, and to my knowledge, it's not too corrupt, I guess. Uh, but, well, I mean, oh, uh, feel free to disagree with me. I, 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 I do believe it, 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 I've met some uh, so, some terrific and uh, and people with uh, a lot of ethics and integrity. So, so no, I, I would say I, I would concur and I would okay. agree with that. I, I, I don't think it's very corrupt. Actually, the the, the institution is also in charge of in, in the infrastructure investment in France, and, and so this is this actually was the philosophy that informed the entire. Um, the entire the way we worked, right? The entire ethos of this team, which was blockchain by essence is a form of infrastructure, but it's a digital and a decentralized one. And so as we were trying to think about how can we rejuvenate public action, how can we uh, defy, uh, how can we just um, beat also the distrust towards public institution that was still strong after the 2008 crisis. Uh, and this was, prior to COVID-19. So, so, so a lot of things have happened since then. But uh, our idea was, since some people fant uh, fantasized about the fact that blockchain was going to erase any kind of public trusted third parties, mm. perhaps we can look into what those technologies are doing well in order to implement that to add more transparency in public action, in order to create new forms of digital identities, for instance. Um, and, and plenty of other um, plenty of other sectors of interventions that that we uh, you know played around. Digital uh, digital identity is for me probably one of the most uh, promising one. Uh, I mean, it's still an unfulfilled uh, an unfulfilled promises, but I mean there are a lot of unfulfilled promises in the blockchain realm. And uh, I, I'm absolutely convinced that uh, when the, it, it's have blockchain, one of the main non-financial impacts that blockchain technologies can have on our digital lives is to provide, you know, self-sovereign digital identities. Wonderful. And so allow me to ask, so you've been also working for the public sector in, in the US, right? Very shortly, so I, oh. I did an internship at the U.S. Congress. Okay, so but, but it was mostly picking up the phone, and I I can say that uh, yeah, you know, picking up the phone, answering uh, lobbyists, um, getting tools of the U.S. Capitol, uh, but doing a little bit of uh, of legal research as well. This was back in two thousand and fourteen, fifteen. So so really um blockchain was not really on my map back then um I, I knew about bitcoin because i was playing a lot of video games and so when you play some free to play uh mm. mmorpg at some point you have people coming around and uh, asking if you want some services against this weird digital currencies that you know you you you, you kind of start to hear about but but i was uh, it was before i started you know yeah, you buy golden coins on World of Warcraft, and then you. Uh, yeah, you well, I mean, a, that, that's more or less like it. But I think that uh, for, for for the people that have been uh, exposed to blockchain uh, to to Bitcoin early, I mean, a lot of us must have been through uh, those kind of activities. Yeah. Uh, one question, though, did you catch a glimpse um, in the U.S. public sector, although it was shorter than the French one, um, of a difference uh, in mentalities between between those two public sectors, between the, the U.S. administration and uh, and the, the French administration regarding the blockchain industry? So, so I count that, but much later on. So, so part of my missions as the, the, the French CDC, I'm not going to say the CDC because it, obviously in the US now, everyone knows the CDC because of COVID and it's definitely not the same thing as our CDC. Mm -hmm. but, but when I was working for the French administration, um, part of my uh, job was to train so legislators and regulators and thus do some legal reviews. Uh, and still today, I'm regularly invited as an expert uh, to speak with uh, people at the OECD or at the ESMA, which is the, the European regulator for, for financial services. 
Um, I've never interacted directly with people from the SEC, but some people from the, the, the FTC, uh, so, so the Federal Trade Committee. And, and yeah, obviously there is a big, big difference in mindset. And it's very easy to explain, actually. Um, when France was started regulated on blockchain, and France is the first, is one of the first countries with Switzerland and a couple of others to adopt a comprehensive legal framework around crypto assets, um, which was in for, for France in 2018, uh, which preceded and uh, very much uh, uh, informed and, and uh, uh, influenced what Mika was going to become after that. When France legislates on blockchain, we try to attract foreign companies. Of course, we try to secure an existing ecosystem because there were a lot of very competent and talent, uh, talentful companies uh, in France. But the approach is necessarily very different to, uh, from the US. So, so historically, we have different approaches on what the federal state should do and how much interventionism uh, should happen. That's one thing. The other is that um, the US, and it actually is true for any form of digital governance, any form of digital regulation, the US having had the Silicon Valley, the US having a lot of the capitals that are funding uh, innovation in fintech through the main VCs, the US having this ability to be the um, home gr the home ground of a lot of those uh, startups can have this very less fair approach. They uh, actually have a less fair approach and adopt. They, they don't regulate with uh, vast legal frameworks. They have this Lucifer approach and they just uh, sanction ad hoc which kind of behaviors they find fit or unfit, which is what the SEC has been doing first with a very, very uh, you know, slow pace. And now they are inter intensifying the action uh, to the point in which the I, I guess a lot of our American listeners are, are probably worried about the lack of legal clarity because that's the that, that's the, the pitfall of this approach. The, the, the downside of this approach is that you are entirely dependent on the decisions that can change of a jury of a regulator, which is the SEC in the US, foremost of it. I mean, there are other uh, legal bodies and legal authorities in the US. Uh, in France and in Europe, the, the philosophy was entirely different. We knew that we had a lot of the potential Main Street investors, we like a lot of people were starting to put money in crypto assets, but the block, the, the, you know, the ecosystem is much smaller. The biggest exchanges, for instance, the ones that were um, absolutely mainstream, were in the US, and so it absolutely makes sense to um, have a proactive legal approach because you do not have jurisdiction over those American companies. And so if you want to do some investor and consumer protection, and also if you want to try to attract, if you've done it right, if you've if you've designed your legal framework right, if you want to attract other companies, especially in blockchain, in which a lot of companies in the early days, a lot of projects were kind of open source or very informal, and so didn't have, were not officially headquarters and headquartered anywhere. So, so uh, there was this kind of mindset of, we need to make to to create a legal framework for two reasons to protect our consumers without being able to sanction companies abroad right like we know our legal framework will mostly apply to french companies and not to i don't know coinbase or F uh, ftx or kraken say three so it's enough right like it checks yeah. the role of uh, those uh, who are not uh, under your, your own jurisdiction yeah. But also, uh, and this was very, very clear, right? Like the French policymakers were claiming that they wanted France to be a blockchain nation, that wanted France to be a crypto nation. And so, uh, for instance, there was some, um, um, you know, the French government kind of winked at Binance to try to have them invest some money in France. And they did, actually. They uh, opened an office here and hired some people. So, so yeah, there is this goal of, the, the, there is this goal that is very different from the US of trying to attract an ecosystem that is not always natively here, 
where has the US has always this privilege of having the ecosystem on its ground, on its jurisdiction, and thus can afford to have this laissez-faire approach in which they only sanction with um, you know, legal decision ex post after the fact when they are happy or not happy. Wonderful. And so it's interesting for me to hear that, for example, um, some people in the public administration want to make either the US or France a or Germany or whatever, uh, whatever the space, a crypto friendly jurisdiction, because at the same time, there are so many politicians um, fearing that it will make them relinquish some of their power. There are some very well established institutions um, fearing, for example, the lack of control, they uh, well, the loss of control, uh, because it's very hard to artificially create inflation or to uh, to inject new <laughs> new liquidity um, into a pool is it is, uh, so is it going to be a technological change with more blockchains that are state owned like C cbdc's or is it a change of mentality that could happen genuinely in in the mind of politicians and my question is not re uh, rhetoric i i'm really uh, no, it's, curious it, about it's, that. So, so it's very interesting because what you're referring to mm -hmm. is a vision of blockchain that was very dear to my heart. Um, when I entered the blockchain ecosystem, uh, one of the first thing I did was to attend a lot of events. And it's crazy how the crowd and the ideology that is underlying those communities has evolved over just a few years. In 2016, 2017, even 2018, so, so I remember during the first week of my uh, of me working at the public administration, Bitcoin was hitting one thousand dollars for the second time, right? So it was still quite early in the history of Bitcoin. The only time it how it, it had happened before was in the Moncox, uh, you know, era. So, so so people, some people were already there for the gamble, for the money, for the financial value, but a lot of people also found it interesting for the philosophical ideology that came with the with the cypherpunks and for me as uh, as someone who has a background in both history political science and public economics like having bitcoin to question what what is money right like what makes economic value for a currency what generates trust what are the infrastructure of trust in a society mm -hmm. are questions that are absolutely essential now this um this face of bitcoin and blockchain in general is the revolutionary side and i i think you will not be surprised when i say it's mostly gone when you see the discussions today around the price of bitcoin and everyone is just waiting as if it's the messiah the announcement that perhaps the etf from blackrock is gonna the bitcoin etf from Black, blackrock is gonna be uh granted legal um like they're gonna have the legal or it's gonna be authorized or not yeah but then again if blackrock has an etf it means that the cypherpunk era is gone absolutely right like this the the subversive very radical and revolutionary uh vision that is really present in satoshi nakamoto's white paper and first uh inter you know communications and in a lot of the foundational documents that that made the cypherpunk culture it's mostly gone for bitcoin and uh and ethereum and i think that states kind of participated into that but not too much, right? I, I think that actually in the ecosystem, a lot of people clearly so that in order for the business to grow, they could either keep, you know, staying below the radar, keep working on that informal economy that was happening before. And, and this time was growing, but very, very slowly or trying to capture 0.1% of the huge client that is traditional finance. And that this um, share of a huge client was already bigger than whatever they could hope working with the uh, informal ecosystem. And so the, there is that 
uh, divide today in the blockchain ecosystem with a, a, a very, very mainstream ecosystem of people that are just trying to do business and that are just trying to uh, create financial value. And in order to do that, in order to maximize the financial value, you need to uh, tackle the mainstream. You need to uh, speak, you, you need to be able to, to deal with uh, big traditional uh, financial institution because that's where the money is. And a lot of people are absolutely willing of doing that trade-off of giving up with that uh, revolutionary project in order to just grow and have very, very juicy business. And that's fine, right? Like, like we don't have to judge them. This is like, I'm not here to judge them. But what I, what I say is that there is just a tiny fringe that still exists, right? Of people working on those cypherpunk ideas. When you're looking into projects from uh, Amir Taaki, for instance, who's a Bitcoin core developer and someone who you cannot question the revolutionary ideology uh, who is working on dark fi and, and like dark finance projects and, and projects that are still very um, attached to the idea of anonymity, to the idea of absolutely in radical independence, of non-traceability uh, of funds. Um, and it, it's both fascinating and kind of scary in the same time, because of obviously big as the divide between those two communities uh, became greater, the niche community had to venture further and further into, you know, uh, they, they became more isolate, uh, isolated in, in their use cases, and they are under constant regulatory pressure, which is not completely uh, logical, right? Like when you're trying to create uh, financial systems that are absolutely untraceable, you can expect financial authorities that as um, that, that have within their mission, within their agenda, uh, to um, enforce anti-money laundering, terrorism funding regulations to go after them. So, but but clearly, if uh, if this uh, giant split hadn't happened, I'm pretty sure that the conversation around crypto assets would have been very different. Hmm. Interesting. And well, there's always going to be that trust issue. Basically, the, the people siding with the regulators are going to say, well, DocFi is a problem because it means you can't trace it. And most people I've met who are delving deeper and deeper into DocFi or, uh, or leaning on the uh, anarcho-capitalist uh, side of the um, part of the political spectrum. Uh, usually these guys say, yeah, well, most of the terrorist uh, terror attacks and most of the, of the drug traffics are paid in dollars and most of the, of the horrible things done in the, in the, um, in the world are basically paid. Um, m most of this is funded by the very same people who, who have the pretense to, who have the, um, the claim that they are the regulators and the honest ones. So how do we square that circle? Is there, do you think there's, there's always going to be those two worlds and they're going to be always split? Uh, oh, yeah. Stay like oh, no. Yeah. That, 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 divorce, that, that divorce has been completely accepted, right? Just if you expect your crypto assets value to go infinitely up, you don't want that. You, you don't want to have to deal with those weirdos. And I'm saying weirdos with a lot of uh, respect. Uh, like Amir, yeah, actually. You, you was, don't want to deal with the cypherpunks if you want to. No, no and you don't want to deal with the regulatory pressure. You want to be able to attract Main Street investors. You want to be able to deal with big VC companies. You want to be able, you, you, want, you, you want the SEC to, valid, to authorize the ETF by BlackRock. And like, this is kind of mind blowing, like like the, the, like to for me to say that because I can remember not that long ago, right? Like six years ago, going to uh, heavens like breaking Bitcoin, which was one of the last major Bitcoin events that I've uh, really loved attending in Paris because there were still a lot of Bitcoin core developers and people presenting the first the, the, the first implementation of the Lightning Network. So this was in 2017, I think, in, in Paris. It was really uh, an interesting uh, event. People would have hated you for saying something as, 
I want BlackRock to have the rights to invest in Bitcoin, as if this should be the goal of anything relating to Bitcoin. So, so yeah, no, this the, the, we are way past that diverging points in, in the history, and I don't think. Uh, like unless you're betting on a total collapse on the financial system um but but even then i mean if you're if you're really believing in that theory then like bitcoin and the don't trajectory buy bitcoin, don't which... buy hunting rifles and and and, ca- and tin cans yeah for, first I, I i do believe that it's not a very interesting ethical stance uh probably because i'm a, a strong optimist myself but also because i think that you should always uh fight for the best scenario to come and i believe that a global collapse of everything is probably not something that is probably not a desirable future for uh, most people, for are, people. Are, are not really ready to, to embrace the consequences of what they, what they wish for when they say that. Just closing that parenthesis very quickly, um, there is this schizophrenia amongst Bitcoin maximalists as when I interact with them, um, is that they both want Bitcoin to keep gaining in value and they both want to claim that Bitcoin is still a good currency. And at the end of the day, it can't really be both. A, a, a very profitable financial asset is quite rarely a very good currency. Uh, and today, if you think, if you want to keep making profit on crypto assets, most of the time, you want, you always want more people in the ecosystem. You always want new capital to flow in to appraise the value of those crypto assets. And this willingness to open the ecosystem to mostly the wealthiest that is like traditional CFI as we call it right like centralized finance institutions uh, is kind of incompatible with the persons uh, with pursuing those uh, radical uh, very you, you, with the original ideology uh, of what blockchain used to be but I mean, and that allows me to loop back to something else. Um, and I'm giving you, a, I, I'm giving you a pass there for, for you to give it back to me for now. But uh, I, I, I do believe that in, in a way, it's in non-financial usage of blockchain that sometimes we still stay true to this original ideology. She's very paradoxical. But, but that's how I see it. When you look at people working on self-sovereign identity, for instance, I find it absolutely fascinating uh, as, a, as a field. And even when states are trying to reuse those technical stacks, well, right? Like uh, in Europe, there is the European blockchain service infrastructure that is a common infra- infra- blockchain infrastructure, which I believe is fought from uh, Hyperledger which is, of course, like plenty of questionable choices, there, plenty of things that could be debated for hours. But the idea of trying to rule out a new digital identity model that is modular and that is truly ownable for people and that would still be interoperable with your the common way you identify yourself uh, with public administrations, for instance, but in this interoperability that leaves you, for instance, the choice to have wallets that are compatible with verifiable credentials that you would spoon yourself, that you would create yourself, that would be an, uh, semi-anonymous or fully anonymous. Like, like I, I believe that here we're, we're touching a, a field that is absolutely, absolutely fascinating and that has the potential to, to, truly, uh, to truly move us from Web 2 to Web 3. Because when you think about it, the power of the platforms, of the digital platforms in Web2 is the ability to control your identity, to gather, to extract all of your data, and to create very complex, very refined identities of yourself and uh, in exchange of convenience, right? Like you only have to input a login and a password, and all of a sudden you can connect with Gmail into any kind of apps you can connect with facebook you can connect with all of those uh, all of those platforms uh offer a ton of services within themselves and on top of that will be your identity provider uh your to interface with a lot of external services 
with a self-sovereign and convenient user-centric and user-owned uh, identity, I believe that we can change a lot of things. So I find the irony absolutely mind-blowing to think that at the beginning, the Bitcoin white paper was originally a, a reaction in defense against a Ponzi scheme or at least a, fa a third party centralized uh, risk. So basically the taxpayer was uh, forced to pay for the consequences of unresponsible actions from the uh, the US government. And that's that's interesting because basically most people from, well, so, sorry to interrupt you from financial institutions with, once again, laissez-faire from uh, governments and administrations that either didn't see the signals or decided to not act upon it. Well, but, there, there was a law still that uh, that made it mandatory to uh, to um, uh, to uh, green lights, um, uh, to green light credit lines to uh, to people who were not able to pay for them also. So there, there no, were, of course, well, probably and not are, with the intent the of basal uh, frameworks for financial stability. There are plenty of international regulations for financial stability. Just what I'm saying is, uh, and I and I'm seeing, and I think I'm staying fair to to uh, to the cypherpunk uh, reaction to 2008. Uh, the 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 first target was the banks and the banking system, and the secondary target was that, uh, and because they are predictive fails, and because they were constantly bailed out when they're failing by the states, the negligence and the lack of responsibility of the states, who, in a way, or at least they the states uh, like policymakers would claim that they have no other choice than saving them otherwise the consequences would be too bad on the economy at wide uh, but, but but really the, the target of the responsibility was first the financial institutions and then the states for bailing them out with public money okay what, what i mean is that the, the the legal framework in the first place um, allowed those financial institutions to be too big to fail that's why um, that one of the the arguments i hear very often is that Basically, most people uh, in this, these circles feel extremely frustrated to see that there are legal frameworks that allow these people to um, uh, to to be an well to avoid accountability regarding their actions, um, which is a bit more than laissez faire because someone had to. It's not that they didn't punish the right people. It's, just, it's also that they created the, the legal framework. But Yeah, that, they let uh, that happen beforehand. Absolutely. Absolutely but, but agree with you. In any case, I find the irony absolutely mind-blowing to see that basically many, many uh, early-day Bit Bitcoiners were absolutely interested, uh, absolutely against Ponzi schemes. And now, basically, many new Bitcoiners are willing to have not not really a ponzi scheme but they have they want to have that endless flow that endless supply of new investors in order to uh to, to make that reach the moon and so this leads us to a topic i know you're familiar with because we've been talking about c5 and d5 and dark five and so refi regenerative finance because <laughs> that's i believe that's one of your uh specialties so can, yeah. can you tell us about that yeah, well, I mean, honestly, I'm I'm not a big finance guy. Uh, I find finance to be something somewhat boring, uh, which is probably why I'm uh, still a, a, a poor lecturer uh, and, and researcher and working on open source projects rather than uh, we are rather than us doing this podcast in my Lamborghini. Uh, but but um, I. I also am a, an environmental activist. I've worked a little bit on the environmental impact of, of blockchain technologies, uh, which, as you know, for Bitcoin is still a very uh, a point of tension and on which my uh, opinion is, I believe, uh, firmly, uh, firmly encored in, in the technical and material reality of this network, which is that yeah, it's it's not good. It's really it's really not good, especially if we want to be able to once again live in desirable futures uh, and uh, and comply with some of the um, uh, so, some of the objectives that were set in the Paris Agreement. Closing that little parenthesis, that could be once again the object of an entire of an entire podcast. 
but there is a ton of, uh, of literature on this. Uh, I, when I was working for the French administration, I also worked on green bonds. So, so uh, I worked on public investment towards uh, regenerative, uh, environmentally uh, positive projects and regener regenerative agriculture uh, and forestry projects. Uh, and how can we use blockchain to enhance the trust in the financing uh, towards those um, uh, towards those projects? And so uh, I find the regenerative finance ecosystem quite interesting. Some of it is fairly incremental innovation. We are looking at you know carbon credits and just trying to place those, they're trying to, to get those, to, to tokenize, to virtualize those assets and use blockchain to enhance the auditability of, uh, of those markets, hoping that this added transparency will create more trust and thus uh, more value and also more liquidity on the secondary market for those goods. It's all fine. Uh, it's probably not very revolutionary, but hey, it's also one way to have an impact on the world to not be completely revolutionary. And you were mentioning CBDCs before, uh, and the irony of uh, of the way the the blockchain ecosystem has turned to to its traditional finance. The, the, even the fact that we're considering some CBDCs that might use blockchain technologies in order to be somewhat decentralized. And once again, there is a ton of work including some political activism uh, for us to ensure that those CBDCs uh, respect privacy, for instance, and uh, become interesting tools for financial inclusion and not a tool for mass, for mass surveillance. My general point is that even the fact that states consider using the technologies to emit currency is, in a way, you know, a realization. Okay, it's already a compro uh, compromise, you say? Uh, well, I mean, you, you are, at least you need to acknowledge that it's a historical impact of blockchain technologies, right? Like okay, it's a yeah. factual impact of blockchain technologies, uh, whether you whether you like it or not. Uh, but uh, there are two ways to change the world, right? Like revolution, revolutions are re very rare and tend to be all a bit violent. There is reform, right? And there sometimes... Uh, very radical projects actually have been impacted by uh, other time, you know, uh, and, and perhaps CBDC is, it will be one of the impacts uh, less radical and less revolutionary than of Satoshi's original vision in, in the Bitcoin white paper. Uh, coming back to, to refi, so there is this uh, kind of incremental innovation in the ecosystem. There are also some projects that I find are absolutely interesting, especially using the blockchain, um, using the blockchains value added for decentralized, for decentralization, for decentralized governance, especially in order to give uh, more tools for local nature stewards, for what we call IPLCs, indigenous people and local communities, in order to be uh, to reverse the ratio uh, of power with the the people that are funding them. So, so when you look at projects like Collectivo, for instance, the bottom up approach that they adopt in order to create local DAOs around ecosystems and around in order to tokenize that creates some financial value that is internationally tradable, thus having being able to invest in agroforestry projects in natural re, in, in natural based solutions for climate change resilience for instance i find that absolutely fascinating so refi for for me is either you know mildly interesting <laughs> or sometimes once again do those have this revolutionary potential when you look at how they try to implement in a factual manner very de decentralized governance in a field that is still heavily dominated by flow financial flows from the global north to the global south and with a very strong asymmetry of power 
between the funders, the people that most of the time are polluting and so are funding those projects in order to compensate for their right to pollute, and communities which are the, on the front line of climate change, right, that rely, whose livelihoods depends on natural ecosystems and uh, who, are, who receive that funding in exchange of uh, credits or someone. And so having blockchain being able to uh, turn this uh, upside down by having those local communities being able to gather together, use open source technologies in order to uh, network with other local communities around the globe, create financial assets that allow those financial flows without being dependent from the goodwill and uh, from the financial power of um, institutions and individual in the global north is very inspiring. So shall I play the, well, it's not the devil's advocate here or, well, some kind of, uh, of devil's advocate position here. Um, uh, um, just to rephrase and to, to, to make sure I understood you well, does that mean that uh, that's an opportunity in order to, um, to prevent some communities uh, that are funded at the moment that are on, on the front line uh, to suffer too much fra from the consequences of an, uh, an asymmetry in the deals that are proposed by some other people who are much more powerful in the, uh, from the financial perspective in the Northern Hemisphere, for example? Did, did I get you correctly? Yeah, like well, to put it more simply, because that's right, I, I'm trying to connect many dots and I'm speaking for a very, very long time, so, so I should probably uh, uh, lean on you a little bit more to, 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 give, to feed me more questions. But oh, to, no, no, to no, no worries, but th th this is, uh, this is p the interest the conventional, of... A... The, yeah. the conventional green finance system is very top-down and north to south, which obviously uh, when you have a big company that uh, invests some money into a tiny project that is supported by local farmers, for instance, mm -hmm. you can expect that there are many, many, in many, many ways, those recipients are fundings uh, are in a state of dependency of um, of asymmetry of power, right? Um, towards to, towards the funders, and and so having thinking about how blockchain uh, can empower those local communities. Uh, to decentralize the governance and stop having this very top-down, I give you money, so please give me back so, some carbon credit or whatnot, or biodiversity credit, or whatever kind of proof that I invested in your project um, is super interesting. One other big issue in the green finance is what we call um, MRV, right? Like monitoring, reporting, and valuation. All of those projects, they have value if and only if the uh, project of the time creates e either safeguards, ecosystem services, right? So for instance, there are some schemes like Red Plus that, 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 that are meant to pay people in order for them to keep their forests up, right? To, uh, so, so you give them a financial compensation to not uh, cut down a forest, which would create some immediate economic value for them, but would destroy natural capital uh, on the long term. So, uh, or you're funding ecosystem restorations and things that would have a net gain on ecological value, right? So, so you either prevent depletion of resources or you create a net gain. And in order to make sure that your investment had some legitimate value, you need to monitor if those natural assets are, st are, are doing well. And, and if basically your investment uh, created actually a, a, a positive environmental impact. And you have a ton of DAOs working on decentralized MLD now. So who can we use tech technology, right? Drones, uh, uh, satellite imagery, uh, smart sensors, IoT, but also, once again, local communities, local experts, people that have some indigenous knowledge, for instance, in culture, 
uh, in order to uh, mm. feed the right information in the blockchain in a in an oracle type uh, of pipe uh, to create trust in the quality and the reality of the impact. And that, once again, is a very, very good way to subvert the previous relationship in which basically either the company that is funding does not care because they received, the, you know, the, what they really want is to be able to communicate on the fact that they invested some money into something. The reality of the impact is sometimes very secondary, or they would mandate, you know, experts uh, to to go there and, and assess those natural assets, which is fine, right? Like we we, st we will still need those experts uh, uh, at some point in the decentralized MOV, but once again, and, and trusting, empowering local communities to be able to, and, and natural stewards to be able to do at least part of that work themselves is very important. And I'm not even mentioning how do we, um, how can blockchain based uh, uh, systems uh, properly help accessing social, like positive social impact, because this must be also you know, part of the equation. The equation. How do you ensure? How do you ensure that those transitions are fair and just? And do lift people out of poverty, for instance? Uh, do these people what? Lift the, the how like do, do those transitions lift people out of poverty? Well, this also you know? this also brings a huge uh, huge load of, of subjectivity in the equation, right? Because. Obviously, fairness is really something is really something that needs to be, uh, um, to some extent, based on subjective factors and uh, and very individual factors. So, how do we assess with the blockchain that those people uh, get the type of fairness they um, they consider right? You will never be able to assess it just with the blockchain. The blockchain can help and provide some tools in this assessment. Once again, when you implement first, first and foremost, when you give those local communities uh, power on the decentralized governance, for instance, of your protocol, you already um, shift once again some of the. Uh, you you already um, create some social value by not letting them being fully dependent on a governance system that is completely remote from their own interest. That means that local communities, for instance, if you have a DAO like Collectivo uh, that takes decision on, so uh, I'm not an expert in Collectivo and I don't think we have time to explain everything that they are doing, but I can oh, strongly but, uh, invite our viewers to will look, be, will look at it. Yeah, yes. exactly. To do your, do your own research. Uh, but, but when you and when you empower local communities to, for instance, do some financial governance on the tokens that will be emitted on the basis of their own ecosystems, on the basis of their work, uh, you, ex you, you give them some responsibility, of course, right? Like it's not an easy work, but you also um, give them some agency, right? Like you let them uh, adapt if they feel, for instance, if they want to prioritize some uh, uh, the protection of a certain area for, for instance, cultural reasons, right? Like if they are mandated to do some agroforestry, but a part of the forest is connected to, uh, uh, it, it would be considered sacred grounds for an indigenous right, community, yeah. for instance, well, right? They could, they, they, they would have a lot more agenda to say, oh no, like we want to protect this area. This area is just going to be preserved and we're going to uh, work on the rest. Or a, a ton of other decisions. The, the, I think the, I have a use the, case. The, the silver lining is really how do you uh, how do you empower them in situations in which previously they would just receive the money and have a mandate by people that have little knowledge and little interest in their local conditions, culture, and practice. Then I think I have a use case for you about that that, that happened in Europe. Um, you know, when I was in Norway, I had the pleasure to to meet a Sami tribe. Uh, okay. Uh, so for our uh, listeners, the Samis are basically people who lived there, um, who lived in Scandinavia and in Russia. So the communities of Finland, Sweden, and Norway are pretty 
still pretty connected, but the the Sami community of Russia because of the um, uh, well, it's it's a bit harder to to go from the EU to Russia because you need a visa and vice versa. So uh, those Samis are quite different, and the Samis from Russia actually uh, mount reindeers, uh, which the the Samis of Scandinavia uh, don't don't. Um, but the, the, the interesting thing is that they all, all have this very old culture and they were very different from the Vikings, but in, uh, in a quite um, friendly relationship. And so when Christianity came, most of their culture was basically uh, wiped clean as when a new empire comes, usually they do that. So there are still little traces of what they did before there there are still offerings to the stone god uh in in the mountains and they and they even told me do not ever take that that's not garbage that's offering to the stone god and uh, if you do take uh, the offering and go back to your country you will be visited at nine and you will be coming back begging for forgiveness there are tourists who had the those nightmare terrors so very fancy story i don't know if that's true but out of respect, of course, I will never test the hypothesis. Uh, but still, what was interesting is that those guys um, had a very strong feud against uh, the Norway and Norwegian government because uh, the Norwegian government would basically give them some funding and tell them, okay, uh, here we can buy wine turbines and we can uh, mine in your mountains. And in exchange, of course, you will be compensated. And by all means, the company is going to be held accountable. And so basically the company was liquidated. And so you cannot sue the owners because limited responsibility and so on. And so is that is that a valid use case, for example, for that type of use of the blockchain? Is it something uh, basically those guys lost their territory for two decades then when they got the territory back they were told oh sorry we we polluted it and it's not really viable anymore and it's been destroyed but you know the company has been liquidated so uh, is is for example that lack of responsibility something that could be uh, corrected with the the use of blockchain uh it's a very good question and uh, we need to work on this during an hackathon to, to, to see if we can do something pertinent there. I, I'm definitely not a techno solutionist. I don't think that technology solves every problem. And which here is, in not, this which case, is not what I think you think. Right, right, right. <laughs> but, but here in this case, and for semi, so for the semi people and for pretty much every uh, indigenous people, one of the first thing that they need is to have some real legal protection because since those communities tend to uh, be uh, minorities, sometimes even ethnic minorities that have been uh, discriminated against or that have lived in very, very remote from the center of powers, mm -hmm. whereas right mining companies, they tend to be very well connected uh, and to have money to invest in lobbying. Uh, Right, that, that you you have this uh, legal unaccountability uh, uh, that, that uh, it stems from this situation, but probably uh, just in, in general, I think that for indigenous communities and and local communities, because you don't have to be indigenous, like local urban communities can also. Yeah, I was giving the, that use case. No, because no, you absolutely. talked about sacred grounds, but we I, I can imagine we talk, can talk about any type of community right. that uh, that has been uh, not respected. No. Completely, completely. Uh, but, but, and that can definitely be one. Actually, one of the projects that I, I, I try to think about in a very, very high level is how can we use blockchain to give a person to give a voice within decentralized within DAOs and decentralized governments to non human to, to non human political entities. So this is something that is derived from the thinking of a philosopher that is called Bruno Latour, and that worked, oh, I uh, love Bruno Latour. Okay, well, there you go. That, that that worked a lot on the on the concept of the parliamentary of things, uh, on the fact that in the way we take political de decisions, we consider only a limited a, a limited uh, amount of opinions within human uh, within human beings. Uh, so first off, I mean, one of the priority of democracy is, of course, the inclusion of the opinions of everyone. But of, but beyond humans, there are all the living beings and non-living beings that needs that that would need in order to achieve sustainable policing uh, and, and sustainability in general that needs to be taken into account, right? And, and so um, projects like um, 
I think it was called Forest as a DAO. And, and uh, it's a project that was, it's a white paper that was published by a collective of German artists that had this idea of a DAO. So, so us, if we have too much uh, crypto assets, we can lend it to a DAO that represents a forest, okay? The forest is equipped with smart sensors when they feel that trees have grown enough the, 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 uh, it triggers a smart contract that calls for lumberjacks that will cut the trees, exploits, of course, in a sustainable manner, right? Like the goal is not to raise the forest and burn it after, but, but so, so uh, it, that would exploit some of the root resources. Using that money, the DAO would repay those loans and after a few cycles, normally the forest should be able to own itself and even to start buying other forest plots around it. And I found this idea very highly impractical, right? For this DR, the, the, like for the, the decentralized MRV that is necessary here to call them the jacks is very difficult. But there is Plus this, the fact that the, it's not really the forest. I mean, yeah, yeah. But 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 there is a very. I, I find it first very poetic, and I think that we should be appreciative of projects sometimes when they are poetic and there is a lot of po and i think that for instance the challenge of bitcoin to its uh, uh traditional currency is also uh, some kind of a david versus goliath uh, and it's undeniable that the narrative behind bitcoin is something that would and i love the narrative from that dao first as a dao uh white paper and I think it's a it's a good idea, right? Like perhaps we can use uh, NFTs and like and have people holding and use it as a proxy, right? Like have people holding an NFT uh, be uh, responsible for representing, you know, not only their opinion in the DAO but also the opinion of I don't know uh, a predicted endangered species uh, in an area or a river. Right, they're like the interest of a river or the interest of whatever you whatever you like, right? Like, I, and I think that the so it's all a bit of a crazy idea, uh, but I like it. I, I like to think that this one is interesting. Just there, there are a ton of very practical ideas that already have a positive impact on local communities uh, in terms of sustainability. So when you look at uh you know decentralized energy projects that mm -hmm. are trying to bring electricity. Uh, to some communities that have very, very few access to those resources. Mm -hmm. So that would use uh, decentralized finance, for instance, for uh, micro lending to help those communities acquire solar panels and then to distribute the right to consume this electricity or to resell it within the community. Like th those are, are projects that are very interesting. Or when you look at uh, ethic hubs and projects that are meant to facilitate uh, lending towards small farmers in order for them to be able to buy material or, or to pivot towards more sustainable uh, agriculture. This is super interesting as well, uh, although perhaps a bit more classical in the na nature. Yes, but, but it's it, fine. It's as long as it, yeah, and as long as it has a positive impact on societies and on the environment, I'm all for it. Well, you know, you know, some uh, there's uh, there's that little group I'm following on Telegram. The name is Did Silicon Valley re or um, reinvent the bus again? And Indeed, you have to sometimes say, oh, look at this. I'm, uh, I'm creating this extremely solar powered, uh, extremely advanced device that basically produces uh, oxygen and it basically uses algae inside of a liquid pillar. And OK, you just created a, a digital tree, dude. Oh, yes. Sorry, it's not useful. And sometimes you have to have th those um, ludicrous ideas because out of this, out of these poetic ideas, sometimes there are incredibly evident cases that uh, that emerge and and yes before they emerged they seemed like poetic and stupid ideas so th that's why we have to have those ideas as well yeah and as i was saying a little bit earlier i'm kind of frustrated right like i, I spent more than six years in the blockchain ecosystem and to many extent i felt like a lot of the promises remain unfulfilled and but but uh, be, be, and, and part of it is because crypto assets became financial investments 
first and foremost. And and so the 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 organizational innovations that lay within blockchain technologies went to the background. Uh, in a way, uh, I am one of those guys that actually don't look forward for bull runs. Quite the opposite. I find uh, when we are entering an economic downturn on the crypto market to be the moment when you see the most inter interesting projects survive because, you know, all of a sudden the noise goes down or the, and you can see which projects actually really generate some value, actually have added value, use blockchain for legitimate purposes. Um, but in general, I think that it's also important to sometimes take a few step backs, as I was trying to say with the, uh, the CBDC perhaps being one of the, uh, uh, one of the, 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 you know, indirect impact or, or perhaps very direct impact of, uh, of the revolutionary project of Bitcoin. When you take a few step backs, you need to acknowledge that the, techno the technical innovation within blockchain is actually fairly limited. There are some, right? And especially what we're seeing today around new forms around, well, new implementations of cryptography such as zero knowledge proof, super interesting, very complex to understand, very complex to implement properly. And I can say, because I've uh, collaborated with a, with a project uh, with cryptographers from the University of Edinburgh to, to try to create a fully anonymous and fully decentralized voting system. And it's very complex. It's called Pebble. Uh, What's that? Sorry. So, so, so this project is called Pebble.vote. And uh, we've actually analyzed the way DAO votes and found it to be absolutely crappy uh, because uh, your vote is absolutely public, which is in general, when you want uh, votes to be somewhat democratic and representative of the uh, actual opinion of people that are taking part in your decision-making process is something highly undesirable, right? You want people to be able to vote what they truly believe in without being afraid that their vote is going to be public and thus that they could be oppressed or corrupted or bad out, or bad out if they would you know want to express their opinion in the wrong direction uh, and so we wanted to take the decentralized voting systems that we've seen and try to combine time lock encryption and zero knowledge proofs in order to make it fully anonymous it's a project whose alpha is out. There are some white papers. It's open source, uh, and, and we're still trying to, uh, to to actually implement it in a very user accessible uh, beta. Uh, just saying that the the technical innovation within the blockchain ecosystems are actually fairly limited. Um, but that's the thing. When you need the, the first time you discover Bitcoin and you try to understand how proof of work works and how Satoshi uh, sorry, Nakamoto style consensus protocols work. Mm -hmm. They are organizational innovations, mostly. The way they innovate from the status quo is how they shuffle the cards and make a new distribution of who has rights in what kind of decisions. And those kind of organizational innovations are the one, are the ones that are the longest to actually have an impact because it's fairly easy when you found a technical uh, innovation that creates some value to spread it around and have it adopted as long as it's cost effective most of the time and we, we we've seen it we've seen the acceleration of technical adoption of new innovation right uh, over the past two centuries actually when it comes to organizational innovations they tend to spread in societies at a much slower pace. Why? Because they they upset uh, they they upset the, the the distribution of power in societies. Uh, the very point of blockchain is to say that anyone can become the validator of a system. Anyone can uh, take part in the validation of a system. Whereas uh, most systems are. Uh, very weakly decentralized, if not completely centralized. Uh, of course, because centralization has some upsides, 
But but here the my, the, the the point that I really want to make is that in a way this organizational innovation still needs to be explored and still needs to be declined into many many different ideas and it's frustrating for me to say that but it's important to both be very exigent in terms of what happens in blockchain and we need to to uh demand for new projects to have a positive impact uh a positive a positive impact either socially or environmentally or, and ideally both uh but it's people that like projects that only bring some financial revenue for me are, are, are not that interesting and not very revolutionary we need this exigence but we also need to acknowledge the fact that changing and shifting organizations is something that happens over time and when i see daos i'm very frustrated because daos are most of the time much more centralized than they like to think for a wide variety of reasons. They are, they are very centralized when it comes to the distribution of the stake, if they vote through stake. They are very centralized humanly because not everyone has few, like, like many hours to invest in, maintain, in learning the culture of a DAO, in contributing actively to it. So, and also once again, because centralization most of the time is uh, a, a re respond to a principle of efficacy, of efficiency. But I'm pretty sure that we we still need to invest some thinking and invest some energy into building projects that try to go back to this idea of decentralization. And if you want, because I see that time is flying, so, mm -hmm. so we, we're going to have to wrap up. Uh, I'm now absolutely convinced, and I'm writing a paper on that, so it's a preview, it's a sneak peek. Uh, that, that blockchain has a double nature. Uh, blockchain technologies have two faces. And that those, the, 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 and for me, it's all about Dick, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, the, the first face, the one that I absolutely love, the one that I fell in love with, and the reason why I'm still in this space today, is that those are technologies that are based on digital commons, on open source technologies, on collaborations in open mm -hmm. network. And this, I believe, is something that is absolutely needed if we really want to change the game. If we really want to have a positive impact on the world, we need that more than ever today to be able to take decisions in decentralized settings in a way that is respecting of the privacy of people and their dignity and their independence and their self-sovereignty. Yes. And on okay. the other side, so... Wait, so, so that's the light side to me. Mm -hmm. If I turn myself like this, the dark side of uh, the, uh, the the dark face of the blockchain technology is that uh, it was first and foremost made to protect individual property. It is very rooted in an anarcho-capitalist uh, vision. It on, entirely relies on the maximization of profit and believe it or not, that this uh, those sound a lot like what we all believe is going wrong. <laughs> what a lot of people, at least, is be uh, believe is going wrong with the economies today, right? Like the neoliberal turn of the 70s and uh, the financial crisis was a lot about this. So well, uh, I, I will. Uh, well, we don't have time for this, unfortunately, because that would trigger a whole debate. But I, I totally disagree with that statement. But but okay. we, we would have to to make another interview to discuss. Absolutely, that, absolutely. I, I I'm I'm willing to take that battle. The just finishing that point. Well, not about both of those spaces ideas. exist, and they actually kind of conflict with each other, right? You see projects um, that. One of the reasons why, uh, like Bitcoin, for instance, is definitely not as decentralized as it was planned to be. Mm -hmm. And it's very clear when you read the white paper that originally the idea of Bitcoin was that all of us should be able to mine some Bitcoin on our laptops and that there should not be around 10,000 or 15,000 nodes today. But there should be as many nodes as there are Bitcoin users. Mm -hmm. But because Bitcoin relies on the maximization of profits, maximization of profits goes with economies of scale and economies of scales goes with centralization. And so 
this right like you have this dr jekyll and mr hyde and in the fact that it's beautiful because it's absolutely open source and still today you i if we have a beautiful idea we can submit it and change the entirety of the source code uh, of bitcoin but at the same time it's heavily centralized for some reasons it has a pretty negative impact on the environment and so uh in order to like i i, I truly believe that this is both and that today, the, the majority of the conversation is really much about the financial aspects of Bitcoin and blockchain technologies, while the light side of those technologies, the, the ones that are meant to create new ways for people to cooperate and act in a trustworthy manner, is one that needs to be more explored, more in, uh, th that needs more exploration, more investment, and yeah, more creativity and more debate. Thank you so much. I, I'd really love to have you for a second episode. Uh, well, to have if your a... audience wants me back, why not? <laughs> oh, um, I want you back. That's already something, but I'm pretty sure the audience will as well. Thank you so much, Pierre. Um, everyone, this was Pierre Noho, a lecturer among other things, but also very knowledgeable about Re ReFi and so many other things. Thank you so much, Pierre. Like, share, and subscribe, guys. You know the drill. It was Thank a pleasure. You. Thank you. Cheers.